guys. Um, I have a feeling this is going to be a good week. It's already looking like it. The weather might have kept some people from coming, but it's good to see the crowd today. We've really been praying for this event and working hard that it might produce uh, some fruit in some way, whether it's a new soul or just the encouragement of the saints. We're Amen. really excited for this. And, uh, let us hope that everything we do today and throughout the rest of this meeting uh, will be pleasing to our God, first and foremost, and that everything will be done to glorify Him. And we're all excited to see each other. I'm excited that Stephen's here. But, you know, try, try your hardest to make it to as many of these sessions as you can. Uh, come to all of them if, if possible. Uh, we want to make it our, you know, you don't want to miss any of these, I have a feeling. Um, I'll give Stephen a short introduction. Stephen Rogers and his wife, Vicki, uh, come to be with us this week from Washington Avenue Church of Christ in uh, Evansville, Indiana. Stephen is serving there as both a pulpit minister and an elder there. Stephen and Vicki are both dear friends to many of this congregation, and many others who will be here throughout this week are excited to come and see them. Stephen was the pulpit minister in Flint uh, back in the 80s, from 1979 to 1985, at the Linden Road Congregation. Uh, that's where many of you got to know Stephen and Vicki through the ties uh, through that congregation. He's been good friends ever since. Now, of course, I wasn't around back then. I wasn't, the world wasn't blessed with my birth until 1992, <laughs> but I think Stephen is still someone who I certainly call my friend and have come to call my friend. He's been a huge help to me as I've transitioned into being the pulpit preacher here, probably more than you guys know. I'll call him up a lot, and uh, you know, I have a Bible question, a doctrinal question, um, I, so I, I def we definitely respect this man. Uh, he's always spot on with the Bible answer whenever I need some practical advice. You know, I can't tell you how many times I've heard, you know, my dad or Ben or Justin say, "You, you should ask Stephen that question. C call Stephen up and see what he would say about that." So we all feel that way about Stephen that he will give you a Bible, true answer as a good servant of Jesus Christ. Um, I'd like to say I'm a I'm a big fan of his evangelism material. It's all out on the back. Check that stuff out. Um, that that stuff's really good. I found it very useful. So practical to be used with. Uh, people of various denominations, and we have much fruit that is coming from, from the help of that material. It does a good job of pointing people back to the scripture. So, you know, we respect him, we respect Vicki very much, and we're so glad that you guys are with us uh, today. So the topic for this hour is submission. It's a glorious concept. So let us give him our full attention. I hope, first of all, you're just grateful to be here in worship today. Amen. And I hope that you, as we've already worshipped, just stop and think about how great the God is that we serve. He's an incredible God. Amen. And uh, I, we owe him everything. I am so grateful to be here. I, the only disappointment for this meeting I understood we were having a spring meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm looking around, where's the spring? <laughs> uh, we had 79 degree weather and I was out working in flowers and uh, all kinds of things uh, over this past week. And uh, so it wasn't bad. We drove up here Friday and I was like, well, and then turn around and ready to snow today. So. Uh, Anyway, it's great to be with all of you. I always love the idea of coming back to be with you folks here at Davidson and being in the Flint area. And I think you and I have dear, dear memories of, of our time here, uh, dear uh, friends and brethren we love with all of our hearts. And so it's a delight to be here and thankful for the invitation of the men here to be back with you. One of the things that we want to do as we study together is to really look deep inside our hearts and ask what has God asked us to do and then how's my heart in relationship to what the Lord has asked me to do there's some things that God has asked us to do that culture uh, doesn't agree with and you and I have to pause and look at our lives and say um, what's my respect for the Lord and how much do I care about what he's asked me to do? 
When you see the topic today, submission, it's a glorious concept. I titled this sermon that because I got to tell you, I think a lot of folks, when they look at that word submission, probably aren't so sure about it being a glorious concept. In fact, and what I've done on the uh, PowerPoint here is just used a different font to put the word submission up here again for this reason. Here's a word in our culture that is one of those lightning rod words that just evokes all kinds of emotions coming out of our hearts. Mm -hmm. And boy, from some people, it's not a very pleasant reaction that's evoked. This is particularly true in religion. And by the way, it's particularly true in the home. What I want to do today in this lesson is to look at the question of what submission is and examine the underlying traits of submission like this. Respect. Submission is a recognition that there's a position and authority that another has that's greater than what I have. <coughs> Secondly, submission involves humility. Our Lord, as he talks to us about submission, would say things like this in 1 Peter 5, 6. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. We humble ourselves to the authority of another if we have submission. Thirdly, submission involves obedience. A mindset of acquiescence that says, I give myself to your authority. You tell me what to do, and I'm ready to do it. Now, question. And by the way, one question is different than the other. How should you and I respond to submission? But how should I do it is a lot different than how am I doing it. Mm. How should I do it is a lot different than am I. And so as you and I study this lesson today, I want to ask you to examine your heart. To all of you who are Christians, listen, brethren, this is not something that we look backward and say, okay, back here is my life before I became a Christian and I submitted to Jesus. And uh, so now, you know, I've already done that. No, it's something you keep on doing the rest of your life. It's something you and I continue to come and face God and say, all right, do I have a submissive heart? If you're not a Christian today, I want to encourage you to think deeply about this lesson. Because Christianity is not just a nice little idea to talk about. Christianity is not some fairy tale. It's reality. It is everything that God expects of us. And for those of you in this room who might not be Christians, I understand that there are some people who are not Christians who are really put off by what they see in a lot of religious people in our world. And it doesn't surprise me. You have so many people that claim to be religious, and they'll go inside a building and they'll act like one thing, and as soon as they walk out the door, they're just like the world mm. all the rest of the week. That is not Christianity. Christianity is that whatever I am when I'm in a building like this worshiping God, that's what I'm supposed to be when I'm outside of these doors. Amen. And so if, you, if you're somebody that's struggling with this concept, uh, I hope today you'll listen carefully. And as uh, Travis has said, uh, we would love to help guide you if you have struggles uh, wanting to know the will of God. We'd love to help you do that. Now, Maybe all of us need today in this lesson to re-examine ourselves and ask, uh, do I believe in submission? Uh, a couple of questions. Do you pay taxes? Don't hold up your hand. Because if you don't, uh, I don't the rest of us have to call the police or something. You know? <laughs> uh, 
uh, we'll call it Caleb. <laughs> uh, do you get permits when you add on to your house? Yes, sir. Now I got a question for you. Why do you do that? It's because there is an authority that's in existence that we need to submit to. Now I gotta tell you, as a whole, Americans don't believe in submission. Now, I'm going to talk in a few minutes about some ways we submit. All you got to do is go out here and get on the interstate, and you can find out how many people submit to the rule of law. Because I'll tell you, if the speed limit, Vic and I were talking the other day, because we came into to, uh, Michigan and uh, in Indiana it was 70, and we got here and it was 70, and all of a sudden it hit 75, and I looked over and smiled, and I said, I wish it was 100. <laughs> and Vicky said, you know, what if it's 100 people wouldn't obey it? It's the truth. But you know what? If we refuse to submit to areas where people have authority, in reality what we're doing is we're revealing our heart. We're saying, my heart is not a submissive heart. So contemplate that. Now, here's what I find interesting about this. I, I think a lot of us study about Jesus. And, and we look at the life of the Lord and we say, well, you know, he's divine, he's the son of God, and he doesn't understand what the expectations are of me. Uh, you know, here I come to the Bible and I have these commands to be submissive, and, and, you know, he gives those kind of commands to me, but he doesn't understand. Really? Well, study with me a few minutes, please. And let's look at submission in the heart of Jesus Christ. His heart and his actions exhibited submission to, submission to God the Father and to the will of the Godhead. He was submissive to the Father's will when he was, and you young people here today, listen to this, Jesus was submissive to the will of the Father when he was 12 years old. Hmm. What did he say to Mary and Joseph? Must I not be about my father's business. He was submissive to the will of the father at the very beginning, that transitional event from his early life unto his ministry when he was baptized. You know what John said. I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me. And the Lord emphasized, you must do it. Why? Because this is righteousness. This is the will of God. He was submissive to the will of his father in what he taught. I love some of the verses in John that emphasize Jesus says, I don't come to teach my own doctrine, my own will, my own teaching, but the will of the Father is in heaven. I love to hear the Lord say things like, I can do of myself, I, I, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment's righteous because I don't seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I'm about the Father and His will. He was submissive to the will of the Father when He was suffering, when He was scourged, when He was crucified. All of that was a part of Heaven's plan. And it wasn't easy. You and I, I think, sometimes have this mindset, well, you know, God's asking a lot of me. Really? Really? Has God asked any of us to go out and let somebody beat us that close to death? Now, we might be in a situation when that happens, but he hasn't asked us to do that every day, has he? Has God asked you and me to be crucified on the cross? No. And I look at the Lord and how absolutely downright terrified and demanding obedience was. Open your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 5. And I want you to read some statements that the Hebrew writer in comparing uh, Moses and Aaron under the law of Moses to Christ and the New Covenant. Hebrews chapter 5 and starting at verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest 
But it was he who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he uh, had offered his prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. That passage tells me that Jesus, number one, was submissive. Number two, in submission, he learned obedience. What does that mean? In our Lord going through everything that he did in coming to this earth and all the way through the crucifixion and resurrection, he learned the expectations of obedience. Here's what obedience expects of you. He learned its demands. And folks, sometimes the demands of obedience are huge. He learned its extent. Sometimes submission can bring great burden, great pain. Even it can bring great heartache and physical pain. But his submission prepared him to be the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Yes, submission can be hard. We may long for his requirements to be different. By the way, did Jesus wish it could have been different? Go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Is there any other way? No. Our Lord living in flesh, having seen people scourged, having seen people crucified, knew what he faced. It was excruciating. It was a horrible death. And you know how he went and in the garden twice and he prayed, uh, can this cup pass from me? And yet here comes that submissiveness. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. So submissive Jesus <coughs> understands submission when he's called us to be submissive and he asks us to imitate that in his life. Now, let's talk about submission to God. When you and I look at our lives and we say, okay, am I going to have the trait that God wants me to have in my life? Submission to God, number one, though, starts with God. It begins with the fundamental principle that God is the authority in spiritual matters, that Jesus is and authority in spiritual matters, and we must obey them. James said it like this in James 4, verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. Just do it. It demands resistance to the devil. He goes further in that passage and says, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Submission to God demands resistance to the devil, and listen to this, folks, resistance to temptation. And resistance to sin. I got a question for you today. How are you doing? Are you being submissive to God? As Paul give, gives guidance for the home, turn your Bibles to Ephesians 5, and I want you to observe some statements as he reminds Christians that submission is not some foreign concept. It's not some theoretical idea, but in reality, we need to understand submission. We understand it in Christianity. We understand it in the church. Ephesians 5, uh, starting at verse uh, 22. Paul says this uh, as he, and by the way, in this text, he's using the home to teach the church about submission. Watch this. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband's head of the wife is also Christ as the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is submissive to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Our Lord says, let's talk about submission and what it means. Why is submission to God something that we ought to find easy and uncomplicated? Now, I'm going to ask that again. Why should you and I find submission easy 
and uncomplicated. Number one, has anybody ever loved you like the God here has loved you? No. Number two, they always want what's best for us. Number three, they constantly help us out. Number four, they want what's best for us now and in eternity. Amen. You look at the Godhead and what they want for us. No wonder we have the call of submission in Scripture. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. Psalm 40 and verse 8, David said, My desire is to be submissive to God. Or as you come to the New Testament and the disciples said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he said, Pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Father, you have a plan for your will. And may all of us have a mindset to help that out in this earth. We want God's will to be done here on this earth, just as it is in heaven. By the way, submission is not obeying when I like it. Watch this carefully. Oh, I'm submissive to God. As long as it doesn't demand too much. Oh, I'm submissive to God as long as I like it. But if I don't like it, then I'm not going to do it. Do you realize the minute we make that statement of what we just said, I am not submissive to God. I, in essence, control my own life. I do what I want, when I want, and when somebody tells me not to do it, or to do something that I don't want to do, I'm not going to do it. That's not submission. That's pure selfishness. It is not, you all know the song, I surrender all. It is not, as you look at submission to God, it is not, I surrender some. It is all to Jesus I surrender. It is obedience. Brethren, that's what God has asked of us. To those of you who are not Christians, that's what God asks of you. He wants you to give your all. Now, I understand you don't have elders in this congregation. Let me say this, brethren. I want to challenge you. You men in this congregation, and you as a congregation, I want to encourage you to be thinking about getting to the point of having elders in the congregation because God wants us to have elders in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say something to all of you, church. God didn't say that, have, that elders have to be perfect. There are a lot of people in congregations that almost have a mindset that elders have to be perfect. I want you to hear me very carefully today. By the way, nobody asked me to say this, so, okay, I'm saying it because it needs to be said. I find it intriguing we come to the discussion about men or elders in the church, and we almost have an idea, here's the Lord in perfection, and the elders have to be like that. Well, you know what? There's not a man ever lived that can do that except Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. Secondly today, let me remind all of you something, church, that the only difference is between elders in the church and all of us who are in the church is that number one has to be a man. Number two, it has to be a married man. Number three, it has to be a married man who has children and they're old enough to become Christians. And it has to be a married man who's mature in the faith. Besides that, tell me what's different than God asking every one of us who's a Christian. Think about it. Now, it's got to be a man who understands leadership. But I will tell you, I find people across this land who have a mindset that elders have to be perfect. That's not Bible. And so I encourage you as a congregation to think about that. You know, Scripture reveals that elders have authority. They're overseers of the church, Acts 20 and verse 28. Uh, Paul says it like this in 1 Timothy 3, 5. It's one who rules his own house, uh, having his children in submission with all reverence, because if a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, how is he going to take care of the church of God? Amen. It's going to be a man who understands uh, the concept of being a leader in a home. Uh, and so uh, I, there's a lot of other things I could do, but let me say this. Congregations need to have a mindset that says we want to do what God says and we want to be scripturally organized and when we have elders, we're going to understand submission to them and passages like Hebrews 13, 17, obey those that have the rule over you and be submissive. I know congregations that don't have elders and they don't want to have elders 
And some men in congregations don't want to have elders because they have a mindset, we're going to lose our authority in the business meeting. Brethren, that's wrong. It's a wrong attitude. And so, I, I, by the way, I know it takes time to develop elders. I want to tell you something in the congregation. I've been in the congregation now for 33 and a half years. I went there, and after six years, we lost our eldership because they hadn't done anything in preparation for it about preparing men for the future. And we had some men uh, who moved. We had some uh, one man who resigned. We had uh, a man who died. And all of a sudden, we had two elders, the oldest man and the youngest man. And after a year and a half, we didn't have an eldership for about three months. And I'm going to tell you, that congregation found out in a hurry how valuable elders are and said, we'll never do this again. And about every two or three years, we work hard at teaching and preparing and developing men to be leaders because we intend that there's always going to be an eldership in that congregation. It takes work. Let me just share one thing with you. In being at Washington Avenue for 33 and a half years now, we have had 31 changes in the eldership in 33 years. And by the way, that's not abnormal. We've had two men die as elders. We've had people move away. We've had guys move away to be with their grandkids. I just can't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> and when I say 33 events, we've had times when we've added three or four elders. I've counted that as one event. So I say to you, Leadership in the church is something that we have to constantly be aware of because it's an ever-changing thing. I, I see congregations that say, you know, well, we've got uh, uh, five elders now and we're set for the next 25 years. You might be. You might not be set for 25 days. You say, what are you talking about? What if a congregation has five elders and all five of those elders get in the car and drive, where were you yesterday? Ypsilanti. Ypsilanti. What, all, what if five, a congregation has five elders, all five of them get in the car and drive to Ypsilanti to a lectureship, and they're in a car wreck, and all five of them are killed in that car wreck? It can change that fast, folks. And so I simply say to us, this is an important thing. But again, we need to talk about submission to authorities. I'm an American. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. Really? Well, can I ask you what Jesus taught us as Christians? Things like this. Titus 3, verse 1. Remind them, Titus, you're a young preacher. You remind the brethren, be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. You obey the authorities. By the way, that was not spoken in a republic or a democracy. That was spoken in the Roman Empire. Brethren, God says you obey the authorities. And observe, obey, don't speak evil. You know what? We're in a, we're in a culture... And I want to challenge you something, brethren. We let the world come into church so often. Politics in this country is absolutely rotten. Amen. You look at what happens. People are so in, in, in our country about politics. It's my party or my party and anybody that's something else. I hate them. I'm trying to destroy them. I want to talk about every evil thing I can about them. That is un godly attitude. You know what? Sometimes we bring in the church. Amen. Now, brethren, we can't have that kind of attitude toward each other. We need to be careful. Uh, you may not agree with the politics of who's the president, but you know what? God said don't speak evil. Wow. Passages like this, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, there, therefore submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. By the way, God ordained government 
to be a blessing to good people and to punish evil people. Sometimes that's governments mess it up. But he says, you be submissive to the ordinances of men. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Watch it. That didn't say God ordained Hitler to be over, over Germany and kill 9 million Jews. Now today people are trying to deny that happened. He didn't say that. God ordained authority. Will people sometimes abuse authority? Well, sure, just like they do in the home and everywhere else. But that doesn't negate the fact that God ordained civil authority. Christians are charged to be submissive to whatever ruler and whatever type of government they live. That's not easy sometimes. And sometimes, and you probably in this country, we can't really relate to this, but there's some of our brethren this morning who are in governmental <coughs> situations where they're violating the law to just be worshiping this morning. I know we don't like this next one. How many of you love to pay taxes? I don't know what people, but nobody, I don't know anybody ever has loved to pay taxes. And yet, Romans 13, the Lord says, if you're a Christian, you submit to authority, you pay taxes because that's the law. Okay? Watch this next one. Because, brethren, I want you to see how the Lord is telling us that submission is so all-encompassing in our lives. Submission to your mate. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 if you don't still have your Bible there and look with me. Ephesians 5 starting at verse 22. Notice that wives, God says, are to submit to their husbands. Now, all of you men, I want you to listen to me just a minute. Guys, if you believe today that God says you make your wife submit to you, you need to stop what you believe and go read the Bible. Because God never said to me as a husband, you make your wife submit to you. Look what he said. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Mm -hmm. As to the Lord. Verse 24. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Now, here's the question, guys. What makes submission easy for our wives? What does God expect men to do so that their wives can find it easy to be submissive to them? And that is to be a humble, respectful husband. Watch it. Look back at verse 25 with me. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Guys, I'm going to ask you a question today. Does your wife know that you have her best in your heart to the point that you would die to protect her. That you would give your life to find an answer for something that would save her life. Does your wife know that? Look at verses 28 and 29. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Love your wives as you love, love your own bodies. And verse 33, let each of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. I have a question for you today, Christians. Do you find it easy to be submissive to Jesus? If you don't, you should. But here's the question. Why is it easy for me to be submissive to Jesus? Because nobody's ever loved me like that. By his actions, by his guidance, by his teaching, everything the Lord's done, he's done it for my best. You know what? Because he loves me so much, it's easy to be submissive to Husbands, are you listening? If you love your wife like Christ loved the church, by the way, I've had some young women walk in my office in premarital counseling and say something like this. Ain't no man in this world going to tell me what to do. 
I'm not submitting to anybody. You know what's fascinating? They're reacting to a bunch of arrogant, hard-headed men who believe in domineering in the home. But you know what's amazing? When I sit down with some young ladies and help them understand what Jesus is saying, husbands, you love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself for them. You know what? I've seen some of those young women just flip in their attitude. And if I can use an old idiom, I've seen some young women who would give their eye teeth to have that kind of man in their life. The problem is they've seen abuse of headship. But gentlemen, when you and I understand what God is saying, and by the way, look back at verse 21 in this text. I think we leave that one out a lot of times. He talks about submitting to one another in the fear of God. Now, that passage does not remove roles. There still is the role of a husband being a head in the, in the home. But rather it suggests that even those who are in authority understand they need to lovingly serve those who may be submissive to them. It just seems to imitate Christ. You look how the Lord submitted himself in order that you and I could have a Savior. Those of us who are in roles and homes of being heads need to learn from Christ. A husband should assist his wife with her burdens and cares. A parent should assist his child with their heartaches and burdens and hurts. An elder should assist members with their struggles. Brethren, how different the Bible concept is from the worldly perspective that stand up and say, that says, stand up for yourself. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. That is an American concept. That is an evil heart concept. That's not a Bible perspective. And so I challenge us today to think about submission to our faith. Those of you in this assembly today who are young people at home, God talks about submission to parents. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. That's how God designed the home. Children are to respect the authority of their parents and to be obedient to them. And by the way, parents, let me say this. If you don't expect obedience and submission, you won't get it. And there's a lot of parents who wonder why in the world their kids don't respect any authority they're not taught in the home. Mm. Watch this one. Submission to those who are older. 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 5. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. That's not elders in the church. That's to those who are older. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Those who are younger are commanded by God to respect and be submissive to those who are older. Now, be careful. Can people, as they get older sometimes, lose some mental faculties that uh, cause them maybe to not be in a position where they ask for the right thing to happen. Mm -hmm. But I want to tell you today, I don't think in America we do a very good job with this one. I think some of us as Christians don't do a very good job with it. Mm -hmm. Brethren, there are some <clears throat> cultures that do well with this idea that when people are older, their children need to take care of them in their age. But i got to tell you, there's, there are a lot of Americans today their mindset is, when my parents get older, stick them in a nursing home and I don't want to see them. I'm not saying nursing homes are wrong, by the way. But I want to tell you, if we have a mindset that says, my parents get old and I don't, I don't want them in my life, we need to back up and look at our hearts. <clears throat> Many see older people as just in position to be ignored or to be pushed away. I want to ask every one of you in this room today to think about the sacrifices. And you, when I ask you to do it, you can't comprehend it. Think about the sacrifices that your dad and your mom have made for you all your life to be where you are today. 
even those of you who are adults, think about what your parents did for you to be able to be where you are in life. My dad died two and a half years ago. He was 96. Uh, my dad said, don't ever put me in a nursing home. Well, thank goodness he didn't have to go to one. He died at home. He was under hospice care for 15 weeks and uh, was able to get around and stuff. In fact, he got better under hospice care. Uh, I was so grateful for that. My mom died in December, this past December, and uh, we had to bring her to Evansville in July last year. Uh, she got leukemia. But Vicki and I had the wonderful blessing of having her in our home for almost four and a half months. And I want to tell you, we cherish those times. It was a wonderful privilege to serve her uh, for a lady who served us all of our life. And brethren, we need to really stop and think about those who are older and, and show them respect and show our heart of care for what they've done. Because you see, here's what this is all about today. Those who have a heart of submission in reality have the heart of Jesus. God has called you and me to learn and to practice submission. <coughs> and the submissive are those who have the heart of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 12, 48, Jesus answered and said to, to one uh, who told him, uh, and by the way, this is a passage we used in the, in, in the class this morning, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hands to those who are believers. And he said, this is my brothers and sisters. This is my mother. Uh, and, and God has called upon us to do the will of him as long as we live. Now, understanding submission let me just quickly talk about what it's not and what it is. Submission is not that I demand that I have to understand everything before I obey. If I don't understand it, I don't get it all in my mind, I'm not doing it. I want to give you an example that's not true. Noah, build an ark. It's going to rain. And the earth is going to be flooded and destroyed by the waters of a flood. Oh, God? What's rain? Uh, God? Uh, what's a flood? God, I don't understand a worldwide flood that's going to destroy everybody in the world. I'm going to build an ark. Did Noah understand it all, folks? No. We don't have to understand it all. God, when he asks us to do things, asks what's best for us. Job, have you read the book of Job? Did Job understand what was going on? Never did get it. Chapter 1 and 2, what happens? He loses all his possessions. He loses all his family except his wife. He loses his health. God, I don't understand what's going on. God, by the way, three smart friends come. You know what? You've sinned. If you just repent, everything will be okay. God, I haven't sinned. Let's have a trial. I'll defend myself. I haven't sinned. He had then some young whippersnapper comes along and says, let me fix all of you because none of you understand it. He didn't have a clue what he was talking about either. <laughs> and Job keeps demanding, God, I want to I have a place where I can defend myself. Okay, y'all ready for this morning? God says, you explain how every snowflake out there is different, and then I'll talk to you. You explain all of creation, and then I'll talk to you. If you can't do that, just be submissive and don't worry about it. Wow. Submission doesn't demand, and, and I want all of you to be careful with this one. But brethren, submission does not demand agreement on everything. A wife does not have to agree with everything her husband does to be submissive. For example, what if a husband's an atheist? 
Does God still tell her to be submissive? Yes. Does that mean she says, I'm going to become an atheist? No. Members are to submit to elders. That doesn't mean they always agree with the decision the elders make. Let me tell you something. A lot of times, members and congregations disagree with what elders have decided because they don't know the whole story and elders can't talk about it sometimes. Oh, can I let you in on one more little secret? Sometimes elders make that decision is not a very good one because they're human too. But you know what, ladies? If your husband is leading the way you ought to, he's going to seek your guidance. He's going to try to get your wisdom. But he may, he may make a decision sometimes that's not the wisest one. And so, I simply remind us that submission uh, doesn't mean that we agree with everything. Submission doesn't mean that you can't try to change the mind of one to whom you submit. For example, let me just use one. If elders make the decision, you know what? It's okay for members to come and say, could I ask you to rethink that? Now, if you go to an elder like this, and you walk up and you start, you start talking about him everywhere, and you start to rake the elders out of the foyer, uh, that probably is not going to build much rapport. Uh, but brethren, uh, if you have the right attitude, people will listen. That's in the home of the church where it is. Now, here's what submission does. It elevates humility. It removes selfishness. It recognizes and respects authority and roles. It's made easy because of being shown love. It responds to love. The biggest thing, why is it easy for all of us today to submit to Jesus? Because nobody's ever loved us like that. Submission rooted in love removes rebellion and anger from the heart. It doesn't necessarily mean inferiority. And submission to Christ changes our hearts and lives. We sang the song a few minutes ago, None of self and all of thee. Can I ask you this morning, where are you in that song? All of self and none of thee. Or some of self and some of thee. Or less of self and more of thee. Or none of self and all of thee. And by the way, folks, none of self doesn't mean to give up who you are. Amen. It just means submission to God and His will when He guides us. What about the song, I Surrender All? Here, I think, is how a lot of Christians are. A lot of people are with the Lord. I surrender some doesn't get it. Yes, submission is a glorious concept. It gives us amazing blessing, joy, and freedom. Ah, oh, but many accuse Christ and Christianity and the church. Have you ever had this happen? Have you ever had somebody accuse the church of being a, a cult or a sect? Listen, folks, the church is not a cult. By the way, what's the difference? You see people who submit to a cult, and it's a cult who they control your will. You have to accept what they say because they say it. You're not allowed to use your own intelligence and your intellect. They make decisions for you and, uh, and tell them that's what you have to do. And that results in anger and resentment and hate and fear and terror and cowering. And most people get to the point they want to run away. No wonder. Contrast that with submission to God. It brings personal choice. God doesn't make you submit. He invites you to your urge to use your own mind to think. You're always encouraged to accept what God says because you see it in the scriptures and you make decisions for yourself and for your life because you're trying to see that here this God isn't caring so much for me trying to guide me the right way and I know they've got my best interest at heart. Yeah, submission is made easy because it's all rooted in love. It's a glorious concept, folks. It's not something bad. I, this song is not in your books, and I'm going to conclude with this song today. Our young people at Washington Avenue sing this song a lot, and I think it's such an awesome, awesome song to end this sermon on. Lord, take control. Because this song says, God, 
I don't want it to just be my mind. I want it to be my heart, my mind, my body, my soul. I want all of it to be yours. Brethren, that's what a Christian is. Do we struggle sometimes? Yeah. But may God help us. It all starts with an attitude toward the Word. I hope you won't see submission of the future as a negative word, but rather see it as a blessing. Today, Christians, would you examine your life? You need to repent. Today, if you're not a Christian, you need to learn who Jesus is, learn what he's done, and be touched by that love, and come as one who comes to faith in him, one who's willing to put sin out of your life, one who's willing to confess the faith in Christ and come and be baptized and be saved by his word. You can do that today if you choose to. Would you come to Jesus for his name? Oh, to Jesus.